Hi, I'm really excited to bring this Christ Revealed interview to you. Let's go ahead and jump in. So sometimes when you're, when you're working this kind of a thing, you, you really are concerned about details, you know, the minutia, right? And, and as you're kind of assessing explanations for any piece of evidence, you, you have to be as detailed as you can. For no other reason, you know that the defense team is going to come in, mm -hmm. and they are going to, with the microscope, go through all these details. So if it, for no other reason, if you are already convinced, for example, that this is not applicable to you, or this is not a good explanation, you still owe it to yourself to go to all the length of it, because you know at some point in front of a jury, you're going to have to go through all that detail. Right. So I always want to go as far as I can before I stop. And that, that's why I think it took so long for me to, to look at, if, if for no other reason, the resurrection was so key that I didn't want to make a false step, especially with cops who are watching me, who are already kind of going to be needling me. Now, I, that's why I kept it quiet for so long. You know, I didn't, I didn't want them to know I was in this kind of uh, investigation because until I knew I was in, there's no point in them knowing I'm even looking, okay? <laughs> so I didn't say anything about it to them. But, um, I, I didn't need to kind of go through those explanations in detail, you know, and I think there's, as I say, there's about six that I would have held some combination, because mm -hmm. in the end, it can't be a resurrection. It, Jesus could not have come out of the grave. There's got to be another way to explain it. Right. Maybe he never was really in the grave in the sense that he was never really dead. And I know that the people had, at the time I was kind of pursuing this, I had read a few things that made me, I mean, I was reading through the Gospels themselves. Look at it. In the Gospels, you recognize he's crucified along with two other people, mm -hmm. thieves. Right. Now, they're on the cross for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly short, if everyone, as a matter of fact, you know when the guards came by to take the bodies off the cross before the Sabbath, the two thieves weren't dead. Mm -hmm. They had to break their legs to make sure they couldn't push up to breathe and they would die quicker. Mm -hmm. So you're saying of the three people, two of them aren't dead. Why would you think the third one is? Why would you think that Jesus, the scripture even seems to affirm the idea that two out of the three, probably all three aren't dead. Now he might look bad, mm -hmm. he might pass out, he might even look like he's dead. But that would mean he's not really coming back from death, he's just coming back from a bad beating. Right. And that might make more sense. So I needed to kind of know, is this a way to account for this? And my experience working with dead bodies was helpful. Because I think most of us in the 21st century have, don't really have a lot of contact with death. Mm -hmm. We might watch it on movies. We might think we know what it looks like based on what we see on movies or on television. But it doesn't look that way. And, and I can tell you that uh, actors are, who are you know, laying still are different than dead people. Um, and if you've ever worked with dead people, you know this is true. If you're a first responder, if you're in the medical industry, uh, if, you're, if you're working at a funeral home, you, you spot death from across the room and you, you recognize it, especially if you're looking at death all the time. Right. But in this generation, if, if, if your grandmother dies, she's, you're not going to pick her up and take her to the funeral home. You're going to call the funeral home. They're going to come and get her. You don't have to touch her. If it, she dies suspiciously, you can call the coroner's office. Right. Either way, you're not going to be handling dead people the way everyone did in the first century because there weren't any funeral homes to call. There weren't any coroner's offices to call. Now we've got a, a whole generation of people who are familiar with childbearing and familiar with death in a way that most of us are not because we've got professionals in those industries that do the hard work for us. So I started thinking about, well, I now know, I didn't know until I became a police officer, what death looks like. There's a thing called a mortis triad. Mm -hmm. And the mortis triad exhibits certain features three features. So the first thing that happens when you, your heart stops beating is that you um, start to cool down. Mm -hmm. That's called algor mortis. Uh, this is a, a cooling down of your body because the hot blood is not circulating anymore. You're cool to the touch. It's noticeably cool to the touch. If you're going to handle anyone for an extended period of time, you are going to notice that they are not their usual body temperature. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking, okay, I, I get it, but they wouldn't notice this? They take down a, a body that's passed out hoping, just hoping he's not dead. Doing, making every effort, to, and, and they wouldn't notice that he's cool. I think if anyone wanted to think he was still alive, it would be this group. Mm -hmm. Yet he's, he's showing signs of death. He's, I'm sure, cooler than a living person. The second thing that happens is you start to, to get stiff, mm -hmm. and that's called rigor mortis, mm -hmm. right? Sure. And, and they're not going to notice this. And the third thing that happens is the most decisive, and probably people think about it the least, and it's called liver mortis. What happens is when, when your heart stops pushing the blood, gravity works to draw the blood to whatever surface is lowest to gravity. Mm -hmm. If you died on your back and I get there and I roll you over, your back will now be red and purple and blue from the blood being drawn by gravity to the back. Mm -hmm. That bruising is called liver mortis. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna see this in the feet of anyone who's suspended on a cross. 
Uh, do we honestly think that these folks who were treating the body of Jesus for the time it took to actually uh, anoint the body, to wrap the body, to place it in the tomb, wouldn't notice those three features of death? I think it's easy for us to kind of make that claim in the 21st century because we don't even know what the signs of death are. But that's the generation that would have known. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's certainly possible. I always say, is it possible they missed it? Sure, but it's not reasonable. And the only thing I care about is what's reasonable. Mm -hmm. Possible doesn't matter. They're not trying to get to be, you can never know anything beyond a possible doubt. I could always level some possible doubt. We're trying to get to be on a reasonable doubt. The second thing, though, about that that, that I th thought was pretty convincing was this piece of, of hidden science mm -hmm. in the Gospel of John. John's a fisherman. He writes a gospel. And when he, you say hidden science, what do you mean? Well, I mean there's a piece of hidden science in a verse mm -hmm. that describes that Jesus is hanging on the cross. Mm -hmm. He's next to the two thieves. The guards come by. They need to take the bodies off the cross. If they're not dead yet, they need to make sure they're dead. And they would typically do that by breaking the legs mm -hmm. so you can't push up and catch your breath and you would suffocate, basically. Right. So the idea here is they get to these three bodies, they see the two are still alive, the thieves, they break their legs, but they don't break the legs of Jesus. Instead, they take a spear and they, they plunge it in his chest. Mm -hmm. And when they pull it out, they see a separation of blood and water. Interesting, he writes in his gospel that he saw water come out of the chest cavity of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now that's interesting because I don't think anyone in that generation or for several hundred years following that generation understood why that water was there. As a matter of fact, if you read the Church Fathers, Tertullian, Origen, you read the Church Fathers in the first three or four hundred years, none of them will describe that water as water. They'll try to make a metaphor, an allegory. It's, it's, it's got to be um, the Spirit of God. It's got to be a symbol of water baptism. It's got to be a symbol of regeneration. It can't be water mm -hmm. because they don't understand the science of death. They just can't figure out why a, a, a spear, when plunged into his body, would actually produce water. Now, we know if you suffer cardiac arrest, if you're beaten the way that Jesus was beaten mm -hmm. before he got to the cross, his path to the cross is different than the two thieves. If you're beaten like that and you go into cardiac arrest or you go into shock first and then cardiac arrest, once that occurs and you've died of cardiac of heart failure, you're going to suffer one of two forms of effusion that I have actually seen in autopsies. Mm -hmm. And the first is called pericardial effusion. It's where the water collects around your heart. But I've talked to the coroners about this, even when I was seeing it in criminal work. That really never happens to the extent that you would see a separation of blood and water. But if you suffer what's called pleural effusion, of course, you'd have to be in the right position. Then water begins to collect in your lungs. Now, he's suspended on a cross. Now, this would explain why when you have the spear in his side, you would see the, the water up as a product of pleural effusion come out of his chest cavity. Mm -hmm. But this is a sure sign of death that is missed by every early reader of Scripture who want to kind of spiritualize it. You know, it's a symbol of something. It couldn't be water. What if John's just writing what he saw? Mm -hmm. He saw water. He's not trying to say, uh, to, 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 to draw an analogy. He's not trying to spiritualize this. He's just saying, hey, they stabbed him in the chest and they pulled this thing out. Water comes out. Well, that makes sense. Now, unless you think that John is so clever <laughs> that he decides to include this little known fact right. that no one's going to know for centuries, right. knowing that when they finally figure it out, they'll say, wow, this is a really legitimate account. So I think that, that, that really the best explanation is he's just reporting what he saw. And what he saw is best explained by the fact that Jesus has already suffered a heart, you know, already suffered heart failure mm -hmm. and has now experienced pleural effusion. And I think that, for me, coupled with those signs of death that I think anyone would notice, I just had to cross out that explanation as unreasonable. Right. And so I, I moved on from that explanation. And I think a lot of people, when you really kind of explain this and they think about it deeply, they're like, yeah. Also, you'd have a hard time explaining the post-resurrection accounts because the kind of beating he took, you don't just bounce back from in 20, you know, 24 hours and all of a sudden you're dancing around and entering rooms miraculously and you know, at, at the edge of a lake eating fish with your disciples. I mean, it's really hard, but forget about all that. For me, I just looked at it from the kinds of autopsies that I've been present at. I don't know if you realize this or not, but... When there's a homicide in Los Angeles County, the investigator has to be present at the autopsy mm -hmm. because they're not going to subpoena the coroner. They're going to subpoena me. Right. And I have to be able to tell the jury or tell, in this case, the prelim, the judge, what occurred at the autopsy. So if you've been to autopsies, you start to look and, and see death and understand what they surely would have seen. And that's why it was harder for me to believe they missed it.
-hmm. He was really alive, and they just missed it. So I, I just crossed that one out. And so then I was off and looking at the next possible explanation. Right. So that, that's really how, though, for me, I moved beyond this possibility. And I think it's all it is. It's not a reasonable explanation, but it is a possible explanation. But I just didn't, I couldn't, I couldn't embrace it for me as a reasonable explanation. Thanks so much for joining us for this interview, for taking this Christ Revealed journey with us. Remember, if you haven't already, subscribe. That way you'll get notified about all the new content that's coming down the road. Comment. People want to hear from you and then maybe you'll encourage somebody else to make a comment. If you did like it, like it so other people know that it's something good for them to watch. And finally, share this. Send links to other people that you know and care about. Cost you nothing but maybe a few seconds of your time, but it might have a massive impact on their life. Anyway, really excited to be able to share this information with you. Thanks for tuning in.